the kids all got this little frightened look on their face when I said report cards. I didn't really care much about report cards when I was in school. It wasn't because I necessarily got great grades and it wasn't a worry. But I just didn't like the um, didn't like the concept of evaluation. Who were they to evaluate me in third grade? Come on. But life is full of evaluation. We have evaluation forms at work that we fill out. We have evaluation forms at the doctor's office. You get a, a survey uh, in your email after you've bought something at Best Buy and they want you to evaluate their service. Um, life is full of evaluations. And um, you have to take it for what it is. It's an opportunity for you to grow. It's an opportunity for you to enhance your skill set, whether it's Algebra 2 or it's a, a skill set at work that maybe your supervisor needs you to improve on. They use it for determining raises, determining promotions, determining whether or not you move from the third grade to the fourth grade. Life is full of evaluations. Everybody is in the business of evaluation. Even Jesus is in the business of evaluation. And we see that in the book of Revelation. Uh, Jesus in chapter 1 is talking to John uh, about why he's there, why Jesus is there. Jesus is going to share with him things that were, things that are, and things that are to come. And part of that is the evaluation of the churches in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. Seven churches that John oversaw uh, in probably some form of a, a bishop's role that Jesus was saying, John, this is what the churches look like today. And I need you to go and share with them what I think about them. The good, the bad, and the ugly. That's why Jesus said, write it down. Write it down, record it. So in one form, John is filling out the first evaluation form that we can see. And he is writing these things down. And the first church is the church at Ephesus. It was a, a big church, a, a popular church, a, a, a wealthy church. And it had some good things going on, and it had some not so good things going on. Ephesus persevered and endured hardships, and they had not grown weary, even in the face of difficulties. And Jesus wanted them to know that. He said, you know what? You all have hung in there during the hard times. But you have forsaken your first love. Now what does forsaken or forsook mean? It, it means to, to leave or to leave behind or to forget. And Jesus said, as, as much as you all have endured, how have you endured? without remembering your first love, which was their love of God. Now think about that. that. That actually sort of makes a little bit of sense. You know, when you go through a particularly tough time in life, things begin to get messy around the edges sometimes. And, and the things that you always hold true to during life are sometimes forgotten or misinterpreted or not remembered well or not appreciated. It's, it's not, I would say, in my opinion of Ephesus, it's not that they didn't love God anymore. It's just that in all that they had been through, that aspect of their life had sort of shifted away and they, they had gotten to the point where they were again trying to control their lives because their lives were such a mess. Spiritually, as a church, in their community. 
Jesus said they need to reclaim that love. The solution that Jesus gave them or that teacher's comment on the report card or that doctor's note or new prescription was to repent. Now you might say, well, that's a little heavy-handed. They, they, they probably didn't turn away from you on purpose. It was just all that life was dealing them at the time. And Jesus would say, it doesn't matter how they got here. They need to turn back to God. They need to repent from losing that love. Beyond Ephesus, we go next to the church at Smyrna. Um, They had a good report. Jesus said they had grown rich in suffering at the hands of persecution. Now that's not the way you want to grow wealthy. But he was talking about an inner wealth. Because unlike Ephesus... When things got tough in Smyrna, they turned to God. Where Ephesus turned to their own ability to take care of themselves. They had the resources. They had the capabilities. They had the education in Ephesus. Where in Smyrna, they they did it. All they had was God. And Jesus said, I see that. Although you have suffered and been persecuted... That is as riches to you. And they had no negative um, response from Jesus. And he continued to encourage them. And he said, stay faithful no matter how bad things get. Now that's one of those things that it's easy to say, but it's incredibly hard to do. As we can go back to those at Ephesus and in our own lives. Where things get so hectic, so out of control, so difficult that we don't think of faithfulness anymore. But Jesus was saying, church at Smyrna, stay faithful. You've made it this far and you have trusted in me. I will see you through. Again, easy words to say, but it's very, very hard to live. At Pergamum, the third church in Revelation, their good report was that they've remained faithful and true in the face of evil. Now, evil is the persecution that's coming around them from the Jewish church and from... (coughs) from the non-religious or other religious entities in their community. They are being hammered day in and day out by everybody around them, mocking them, abusing them, taking stuff from them, not allowing them to participate in the fullness of the community around them. And Jesus says that even in the face of this, they have remained faithful. But... Some have followed after false teachers. So he looked at the community as a whole, and then he he drilled down a little bit. Now that's like a parent-teacher conference. Okay, You get your report card, and it has the grades and a couple comments. And then the, the parents go in to meet the teacher, and that teacher sort of drills down a little bit into more specific areas about your child that they want to share with you personally. And it might be uh, their emotional well-being in the classroom or, or that, um, that they're, they're not following directions as well as they should or they're being influenced negatively by another peer. You might not see those things on a report card, but when you go for that teacher-parent conference, those are the things that come back out. Well, Jesus says, you know what, um, Pergamum, as a whole, y'all are doing all right, but I'm going to drill down a little bit, and there's a few of you that are following after false teachers and again he says repent and if they don't repent clean house get rid of them get them out of your community of faith they don't belong there they don't belong with you they will corrupt you well I thought we were doing well 
You are. But if that number continues to grow and, and those false teachers continue to teach and those people continue to believe, that that, that side's going to grow and soon it's going to overwhelm the church as a whole. And the church is going to lose everything that it had gained in the positive. So he wants those who have fallen under the teachings of the false teachers to repent. But if they don't, the church must deal with it swiftly or the whole church will suffer. Thyatira is the next church. And they too had a good and negative report. They were faithful servants to the kingdom and they were good workers. They were a hearty bunch of Christians. They put the plow to the ground and they didn't stop. But they were putting up with worldliness in the church. They were putting up with with things that that made them feel good and look good. And they loved that pat on the back and, and, and that admiration and praise they got from other people. Jesus is saying that that's not why you work hard. That's not why you serve. That's not why you do what you do. And again, he says, repent or clean house. Get your house in order. Spiritually, as a church, get your house in order. We go back to our text scripture where Jesus explains the lampstands and the stars He is holding those stars in his hand and he's beside the lampstands. He has total control over the angels and the churches. He has the ability to lift them up and he has the ability to tear them down. So when he says repent or clean house or or get your house in order, he means it. Even in our day to day, we see churches that no longer function as churches. Church buildings that have become community buildings, church buildings that have become YMCA's, church buildings that have become thrift stores, and church buildings that have become country clubs that still meet on Wednesday and still meet on Sunday, but it's all about who got the next promotion and how uh, how much did you spend on that new blazer and what kind of car are you driving into the parking lot. And the ministers on staff cater to the people's whims. What do you think they want to hear this week? Well, they want to hear how great they are. All right, let's tell them how great they are. It's no longer about God and His glory and His power and His might. It's no longer about the Creator. It's all about them. Oftentimes when we think of Jesus... Um, snuffing out one of the candles on the lampstands. We, we want to think in the term of revelation of some catastrophic destruction of a church. But that's not the way it goes. Most churches go very quietly into obscurity. Because they didn't listen to Jesus. See, the seven churches in Revelation are examples of every different type of church. And the words that Jesus gives them are the words that he can speak to us as well. We can look at Sardis as the next church. Where it says, just a few have remained and uh, faithful and will be blessed. So this is a church on decline. This is a church that is falling quickly by the wayside in their effectiveness and their ability to minister to their community. Everyone else was just faking their faith. This was a church on a way to country club status. But Jesus looked down and he said, even for the faithful, I'm going to continue to bless them. But everybody else will suffer the consequences. And then Philadelphia. It was a church that was weak, but strong. And it had kept God's word. 
So you don't have to be a giant church to, to make a difference for the kingdom of God. You don't have to be a Southeast Christian uh, or a T.D. Jakes church or uh, you know, some other mega church that you see on t- television to make a difference. What you need to be is a church on fire for the kingdom. And Philadelphia was this type of church. The church of brotherly love. Weak in the eyes of man, but strong in the eyes of God. No negative evaluation. The challenge was to hold on and to hang in there. You're making a difference. Don't give up. Don't look at what it looks like. Recognize it for what it is. So often when people come by Woodland, <clears throat> you know, that maybe have never been here, they say, oh, what a beautiful little church. And it is. It's a beautiful little church. You know, but that word little that's used so often does not have to limit us in our ministry and does not have to limit our effectiveness in the kingdom of God. We can have as grand an impact as one of those big churches around our community. Not because of what we do or or because we've worked hard or because we've tried our best, but because we've allowed God to work through us. We've allowed God and His glory and His grace and His power and His wisdom to use us as His tools to share the love of Jesus. Size is irrelevant in connection with effectiveness. The last church that's mentioned is the church at Laodicea. There is no positive evaluation at all. The negative evaluation is that they are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. This actually goes back, if you took the Revelation Bible study, uh, you'll know, up in the hills were the cold springs, a few miles out of Laodicea. And just down below Laodicea were the warm springs, the, the, the nurturing springs, the, the health springs. So people could, could go up to the hills and get cold, refreshing, wonderful water, or they could go down below town and get the warm, soothing, health invigorating waters from the springs, but the water that was in Laodicea was lukewarm, and it was tainted. It was not good water. And Jesus says, just like the water in your city, so are you the church. You either need to be hot or cold. Get off the fence and choose what you will do. Choose whom you will serve. Then we have Woodland. I've left these blank for us. And I'm hoping that over this year we can fill in some of those blanks. And if there are things that need correcting, that we can through prayer and through study and through humility correct the things we need to correct in our church. And if there are some good things going on that we don't get a big head about it, that we don't go around patting ourselves about it or, or calling the newspaper and saying, guess what Woodland's doing? But that we can continue in humility to serve and love God. And that if God, through Christ or His Word or through heavenly revelation, tells us what to do, that will be faithful to do it. That's what's exciting about a new year. And that's what's exciting about looking at the churches of Revelation because they're a wonderful snapshot of all the same types of churches today and they're a wonderful snapshot of Woodland. So we have to ask ourselves, are we persevering, growing rich in our suffering, staying strong, remaining true in the face of evil, faithful servants, strong workers, having kept God's word? Some of the positive comments that Jesus shared with the churches. Or, 
Are we leaving behind our first love, following after false teachings, following after the worldly ways, or faking our way through faith? Some of the negative comments Jesus made in his evaluations. Are we faithfully flabby, lukewarm, or lazy faithers? Now, that's not a real word, but it fits. So let's go with it. You know, you're good, you're bad, or you're indifferent. Ultimately, that's what a report card tells you. That's what a work evaluation tells you. That, that's what a program evalu evaluation tells you. That's what a doctor's evaluation tells you. We need to be willing to look at ourselves in the light of God's perfection, in the light of God's goodness, and say, how are we doing? You know, it's all about God. Self-evaluation here isn't about us. It's still about God. Are we being faithful to Him? So what do we do? Repent, stay strong, persevere, keep the faith, heat things up. That's that solution that God's speaking to our hearts as a church. And as we move forward into 2015, it's our opportunity <clears throat> to make sure that we're on track with Him and His plan and His purpose. I have been to the country club churches. I have been to churches in decline. I have been to mega churches. And I've been to home churches. And everything in between. And it doesn't matter how big or how small that church is, you know if God is present. God is in this place. Is he here today to commend us, to rebuke us, to correct us? He's certainly here to love us and to forgive us. Those are some questions I hope to answer in the weeks and months ahead with you as we listen for the voice of God. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I was dead and now I am alive. That same Jesus who spoke to John in Revelation and told him to record these things is the same Jesus who is alive today in heaven. We serve a God who can do all things. He simply asks us to be faithful. As we close our service today and as we move forward into a new year, let us challenge ourselves as individuals and corporately as a church to be faithful to what God has called.